Now, Revelation chapter 11, verse number 1, the Bible reads, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, first of all, let's look at those two time frames. In verse 2, we have mention of 40 and 2 months. And then in verse 3, we have 1,203 score days. Well, if you do the math on that, 1,260 days is 42 months of 30 days apiece. Now, there are a lot of people who will try to take the prophecies of Revelation, and they'll try to say that the 1,260 days represents 1,260 years or that the 1290 days represents 1290 years. And they'll try to make all kinds of connections with, you know, oh, this mosque was built in this year and Israel became a nation in this year. And if you back up 1260 years, but wait a minute, the Bible's defining itself here. When he says 1260 days, he means 1260 days because then he redefines it as 42 months. Now, when we study the book of Revelation, it becomes apparent that there's a seven year period that's dealt with in the book of Revelation. People often refer to this as Daniel's 70th week because in the book of Daniel, it's referred to as a week or a, you know, a period of seven years. Well, that period is divided in half. In the midst of the week, there's a major event called the abomination of desolation. That's where the Antichrist enters into the temple and states that he is God. That's where he receives the deadly wound and so forth. So when we're looking at chapter 11 and we're dealing with a period of 1260 days 42 months, three and a half years. The first thing we want to ask ourselves is, are we dealing with the first three and a half years or are we dealing with the second three and a half years? Well, if you read the whole chapter, we'll get to it a little bit later in the sermon, but we see that the chapter ends with the seventh trumpet sounding. And we see that when the seventh trumpet sounds, jump down to verse 15, if you would, it says, and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So when we get toward the end of chapter 11, we see that the seventh trumpet sounds. And in chapter 10, he had said that when the seventh trumpet sounds, he said the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. And then we see the millennial reign of Christ beginning because it says that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So basically it's clear that what we're dealing with in chapter 11 is the second half of the seven years, the second half of Daniel's 70th week. Now that becomes even more apparent when we look at the events that begin chapter 11. It says in verse two, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. Now go back if you would to Luke 21 in your Bible. And I'm gonna show you that in Luke 21, the Bible mentions the same event. Let's start reading in verse 21 of Luke 21 to get the context. It says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. Watch verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land. And watch this and wrath upon this people. So the question is, what people is he talking about that are going to experience God's wrath? Well, he's saying it's them which are in Judea that need to flee because there's gonna be great wrath on this people. Then he says this, and they shall fall, who? The people that he just mentioned, upon whom is great wrath. He said, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now compare that with what we saw in Revelation 11 too. It says, it's given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. So it's the exact same wording. Revelation 11 too says, the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. In Luke 21, it says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Trodden is the past tense of tread. And so it's the identical wording there. And what it's saying is Jerusalem is gonna be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles for 42 months. Look what it says next in Luke 21. 
it says in verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. So what we see here, if we compare Revelation 11 with Luke 21, that at the midpoint, because remember, it's going to be trodden under for three and a half years. That three and a half years ends with the millennium starting at the end of chapter 11. So what we see is that at the midpoint, around the time of the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist enters the temple and declares himself to be God, at that same time, we begin to see Jerusalem trodden underfoot and we see the Jews being punished by God, God's wrath being upon the Jews. You say, why would God's wrath be upon the Jews? Well, here's the thing. They've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and they still to this day, thousands of years later, continue to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, God's wrath is upon them. You see, it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, for you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. He said, to fill up their sins always for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. So in 1 Thessalonians 2, the Bible specifically says that because they crucified Jesus, killed the prophets, persecuted the apostles, God's wrath is on them. Not only that, but it says in John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Okay, so we see God's wrath on the Jews, not on Christians, not on the saved. The Bible says God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, there's great wrath upon those people. Now, a lot of people will try to say that the Olivet Discourse, which is what is the theological term for Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, they'll say the Olivet Discourse is talking only to the Jews, right? And this passage, it's, it's pretty much a similar passage in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. They say, oh, that's only talking to the Jews. Even though at the end of Mark 13, it says, what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. He's obviously talking to believers. But what's interesting is that in Luke 21, he draws a distinction between the Jews and who he's talking to. Because when he talks about the Jews, he talks about them as, oh, these people. Yeah, there's going to be wrath on this people. But then when he uses the second person in verse 28, he says, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. That's not talking to the Jews. He just mentioned the Jews. God's wrath is on them. And you know what their fate is? Not to go up in the rapture because they don't believe on Christ. Their fate was, if you look down at your Bible there, in uh, verse number 24, he said, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. That's their fate. That's what's going to happen. They're going to be destroyed as a people. They're going to be killed. They're going to be scattered. God's wrath is on them. And we know that that period of Jerusalem being trodden down is going to last for three and a half years, according to Revelation 11. And then he says, when these things begin to come to pass, that's when Christ comes in the clouds. That's when we look up and our redemption draweth nigh. Now, what that tells me is that the rapture comes after the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. Because these things begin to come to pass at the midpoint. Go back, if you would, to Revelation 11. They begin to come to pass at the midpoint. That's where the abomination of desolation takes place. That's where the very heavy persecution of believers begins, at that abomination of desolation at the midpoint. And he says that except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Let me ask you this. Is the time that the Jews are being uh, killed and scattered, is that cut short? No, that lasts for 42 months, lasts for 1260 days, nothing short about that. But we as believers will be rescued out shortly after the midpoint, just a few months after the midpoint. 
you know, a few months of that intense persecution, and then, of course, Christ comes in the clouds. That's when we know that it's near, even at the doors. Go back to Revelation 11 with that in mind. So it says in verse 2, The court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. So when are these two witnesses going to be preaching and prophesying? In the second half of the week. Now, the second half of the week is mainly characterized by God's wrath. After the rapture takes place, after Christ comes in the clouds, after the trumpet sounds, that's when God begins to pour out his wrath on this earth. The seven trumpets and the seven vials. These men, these two witnesses, will be prophesying during that time of God's wrath being poured out. Okay? Now, that becomes apparent as we keep reading here. Look at verse number four. It says, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's a reference to Zechariah chapter four. Now, I would turn with you to Zechariah four, except that if you go back to Zechariah four, it really doesn't shed any light on this. It's so cryptic and enigmatic. You can read it on your own if you like, but I've never really found any insight in Zechariah four as to, as to what these guys' ministry is that, than what we can see here in Revelation 11. Revelation 11 is more clear, is what I'm saying, than Zechariah four. It says, they're the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. But I will say this, it's interesting that they are likened unto candlesticks. Now, if you study candlesticks throughout the Bible, first of all, there was the candlestick that was in the sanctuary of the tabernacle. Remember when they built the tabernacle and they had the holy place and then they had the most holy place? Well, in the holy place, there was a table and there was a candlestick and there was the showbread on the table. Well, the bread there obviously represents the word of God because often the Bible likens his word unto our daily bread that we, that we need every day. And the, the lamp there, the candlestick that was next to the bread, it illuminated God's word. It, it, it lit up the whole place and it basically burned oil. So what does that represent? Well, the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. God's word is often called a light in the Bible. But not only that, the Bible tells us that when it comes to our testimony before the unsaved, he says, you know, no man lighteth a candle and putteth it under a bushel, but he said he putteth it on a candlestick. And then it says, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He also says uh, unto the apostles in Matthew chapter 10, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And so what God is talking about here when he says these men are two candlesticks, they're preachers, they're prophets, they're witnesses, and they're shining the light of God's word by preaching God's word. The Bible talks about us holding forth the word of life. Uh, shining the light of the glorious gospel so that the unsaved can hear the truth. It says that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. We need to shine the light of the glorious gospel. So these men are preachers shining the light of God's word. And what's interesting is that he says, look, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the air, that preach ye upon the housetop, don't put it under a bushel. What that tells me is that I, as a preacher, need to preach God's word as loud as I can, as clearly as I can, and I shouldn't put any of it under a bushel or try to conceal it. Amen. You see, there are people today who conceal parts of the Bible that are unpopular. You know, they want to get up as a preacher and preach the messages that people are going to like, preach the messages that are going to make people feel good, and that's the parts of the Bible where they'll just kind of park it. And then when it comes to the parts that are a little bit offensive maybe to this world or a little less popular, they want to put that under a bushel. We as preachers ought to be shining the light, preaching from the housetops, everything we believe, every word of the Bible. Let God's word shine the light on the darkness and expose the sins that abide in the darkness of our world. Shine the light on them, expose them, bring them to light. So these are all just telling us that these guys are preachers. When he says they're witnesses, witnesses is another word for preachers because he says in Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He's saying you're going to preach the gospel in these areas. You're going to be my witnesses. 
He says they're the two candlesticks. They're clothed in sackcloth. It says in verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. You say, well, you know, why would anyone want to hurt them? Because when you preach the word of God and you shine the light of the truth, people want to hurt you. That's why right after Jesus said in Matthew 10, right after he said, you know, what I tell you in the ear, preach upon the house of, what I tell you in the darkness, speak it in the light. The next thing he says is, and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Right after he tells you to preach everything that he teaches, he says, don't fear them that kill the body. Why? Because when you preach the truth, people want to kill your body. You know, people want to fight you. People want to persecute you. The Bible says, yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You say, well, you know, I, I know a lot of great preachers and they're, they're never persecuted. Well, you don't know a lot of great preachers because <laughs> if they were great preachers, they'd be persecuted. They'd go through trials and tribulations for preaching the word of God. Uh, it's never going to be easy. But, but look what it says here. It says, if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour. I mean, you want to talk about a fire breathing preacher. You know, it says fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now this makes perfect sense that these guys are smiting the earth with plagues and that this is happening during the period when God's pouring out his wrath in the second half of Daniel's 70th week. Because God's going to be turning a lot of water to blood. He's going to be raining a lot of fire and brimstone. So it makes sense that these guys would be bringing on those type of plagues at that same time. Now, there's been a lot of discussion through the years about the identity of, you know, who are these two witnesses? And different people have different views on this. Some people's view on this is that, you know, these are just two random guys. I mean, these could just be two guys that haven't even been born yet, or maybe they're living amongst us that God's going to use to be these preachers because he really doesn't give us any names here. He just says they're his two witnesses. And then other people will say, you know, this is Moses and Elijah come back. Other people have said Enoch and Elijah, and I'm, I'm going to examine that, and I'm going to give you the evidence for these various theories. But I'll tell you right now, my personal belief, and I'm going to give you a lot of evidence for this belief, is that this will be Moses and Elijah come back. Now, the main reason I believe that is found in Matthew 17. Go back to Matthew 16, verse 28, and I'm going to show you the main reason why I believe that this will be Moses and Elijah. First of all, they're not going up in the rapture, okay? Because these guys start prophesying at the time of the abomination of desolation. The rapture happens after that. They don't go up in the rapture. So for them to just be random guys that are alive today, you know, that wouldn't really be consistent with what the Bible teaches about the rapture. Because the Bible teaches that the rapture, you know, that, that those of us that are saved, we which are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. These guys are not caught up. These guys are still there. Now, the reason that I believe that this is Moses and Elijah is found in Matthew uh, 16 and 17. Look at chapter 16, verse 28. It says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, a lot of times when Jesus preached, he spoke in parables and dark sayings. And a lot of people misunderstood the things that he said. And this is one of those things that the people that were there, they misunderstood him. Because when he said, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, Till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. A lot of people interpreted that, that, you know, Jesus Christ is going to return in their lifetime. And the reason he said some of them is maybe he's looking at people that are older folks and saying, well, you know, you guys might be gone, but you younger folks, you're still going to be alive. This is going to happen soon. But that's not what Jesus meant at all. Because here we are 2,000 years later almost, he still hasn't returned. That's not what he meant. What he really meant becomes obvious in chapter 17. Look at the first word of chapter 17. What is it? And, and right? So this is a conjunction. We're, we're continuing right where we left off with that thought. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared who? Unto them? Moses and Elijah, talking with them. 
Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make your three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So he says, look, there are some of you standing here that are, but you're not going to taste of death until you see the son of man coming in his kingdom. And then in the next breath, some of them, not all of them, some of them, namely Peter, James, and John, are brought up into a mountain and they are shown a view of Jesus Christ coming in his kingdom. You see, when they normally saw Jesus, he looked like an ordinary man. But when they see Jesus in the mount, they see him coming in his kingdom. Therefore, he is bright as the light and white because in Revelation, when he returns, that's how he's pictured. Okay, so that's how they see him. And isn't it interesting that he just happens to have two guys with him? When he's coming in his kingdom, he's got Moses and he's got Elijah. Further evidence is that the way that Moses and Elijah died, okay? First of all, when Moses died, the Bible says that he went up into the mount and he got to look and see the promised land. Then he died and the Bible says that the Lord buried him and that no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. So God actually specifically buried Moses. Why did he do that? Not only that, but in the book of Jude, verse 9, it says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. So there's something significant about that body of Moses, isn't there? If God specifically buried it in a hidden location, and if Michael the archangel disputed with the devil about the body of Moses. Okay, so that could indicate that this is part of the plan of the second coming of Christ is that, you know, Moses is going to be brought back. Then if we look at Elijah, the Bible never even specifically says that he died, but rather he was taken up in a chariot of fire in a whirlwind. You remember that? And the chariot came down and scooped him up in the presence of Elisha. So these men both had something interesting about their departure from this world that can indicate that, you know, they're going to be coming back, that they're not quite finished on this earth. So that's some pretty strong evidence that it's Moses and Elijah. Jesus brings them with them in the sneak preview of the second coming in Matthew 17. They both have something interesting about the way that they left this world. They did not leave this world in an ordinary way. And thirdly, this, if you look at the miracles that the two witnesses did, it's the same types of miracles that Moses and Elijah did. The Bible specifically mentions these two witnesses turning water into blood. Isn't that the miracle that Moses was used to perform yep. in the book of Exodus? The first thing he did, right? He turned the water into blood, turned the Nile River into blood. Not only that, but the Bible tells us of Elijah in James 5, it says that he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So how long did Elijah pray for it not to rain back in the book of 1 Kings? Three and a half years exactly. How long are these two witnesses prophesying? Three and a half years exactly. And it says they have power to shut heaven, that it rain not on the earth in the days of their prophecy. So all of this evidence compounded makes it pretty clear. This is probably Moses and Elijah, you know, doing the exact miracles. They're coming with Jesus in Matthew 17. You know, one of them, it doesn't even say he died. The other one's body was hidden away and the devil's trying to get a hold of it or whatever. So there's a lot of really strong evidence for this being Moses and Elijah. And so that's what I believe. But, you know, I can't really tell you for sure because the Bible doesn't really spell it out. But... You know, I, I think it's pretty clear. Now, a lot of people will say this. They'll say, well, no, it's Elijah and Enoch. You know, and go, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 9. Here's the verse that they'll point to to prove that it's Elijah and Enoch. And you say, well, why Enoch? Well, because if you remember, Enoch did not die. The Bible says in Hebrews 11:5, 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So the Bible teaches that Enoch did not see death, but that rather he was just translated. And I've heard people say this, well, everybody has to die at least once. And they'll quote this verse, Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And they say, see right there, the Bible tells us that, you know, you've got to die once. And so because Elijah and Enoch didn't die, they have to come back just so that they can die. Okay, now here's why that theory makes absolutely no sense. Because first of all, if we read what the passage is actually saying, it's actually teaching the exact opposite 
of, of what they're saying that it's teaching, you know. And here's why. Because first of all, we can prove that no, not everyone has to die. Because what about at the rapture? What does the Bible say? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So that says, no, we're not all going to sleep. So everybody who survives and lives to the time of the rapture is not going to die. And the Bible tells us that at the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, it says that them also which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with them. In the next verse, he calls the asleep in Jesus the dead in Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. So is everybody just have to die once? No, that doesn't hold up. Not only that, but there were people in the Bible who died twice. Think about Lazarus. Lazarus died and was dead for four days. Jesus Christ raised him from the dead. But is he still alive today? He died a second time, didn't he? And then also, remember when Jesus went into the city of Nain and there was a funeral going on. He walked up and put his hand on the coffin. The child came back to life. Elisha raised a dead body in the Old Testament. So all throughout the Bible, we have people who died twice. We have people dying zero times at the rapture. So taking this verse and saying, well, everybody has to die once, so Enoch and Elijah have to come back so that they can, you know, die. Look what the Bible actually says. Look at verse 25. It says, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So here what the Bible is saying is that Jesus Christ died for us once. He was offered once to pay the price for our sins because it's appointed unto men once to die, for their sins. He came and did that for us. He came and died for us. So what this is saying is that he died so that we don't have to. Now, yes, we will die physically, but you know, this is just the body. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know, when, for the Christian, death has no sting. Death is just a departure. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So death for the believer is only just a physical death. It's not really death at all. There's no sting. There's no victory. It's just a departure to be with Christ. Okay, so to say, well, these guys have to come back and die. It was like, well, Jesus died for us. Nobody has to die. We shall not all sleep. Therefore, if we take away Hebrews 9.27, since we've now properly interpreted it, there's really no evidence left for this being Enoch. I mean, you, you really walk away and you don't have any evidence that Enoch is, is one of the witnesses. Now, Enoch is a great picture of the rapture, you know, because he, he didn't die. He did not sleep. He was just changed. He was translated. He was caught up. So Enoch is a great symbol or, or picture of the rapture, okay, but he's not one of the two witnesses. Just not happening. But it's funny because people will try to say, well, you know, Enoch is a great picture of the pre-tribulation rapture, because he was, you know, raptured right before the flood. I mean, I've heard this many times. <laughs> Enoch was raptured right before the flood, you know, and, and so he's a great picture of that. But here's what's funny about that. If you look at the actual story of Enoch in Genesis 5, and you do the math of the years of the different sons that were born, Enoch did not die, but he was translated when he was 365 years old, okay? The flood, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but the flood happened over 600 years after that. Now, I wouldn't call, would you say that's right before the flood? I mean, just he was raptured right before the flood. Uh, no, it was over 600 years. Now, here's the thing. Who's the oldest man who ever lived in the Bible? Who lived the longest? 969 years, and it was Methuselah, right? Let's put it this way. Even if Enoch lived to be the oldest man who ever lived, even if he outlived Methuselah, the oldest man who ever lived, he still would have died of natural causes before the flood even came. Okay, so no, he did not get raptured out to avoid the flood. You know, but people say these things, they sound cute, but when you actually look them up, they don't hold water, no pun intended, you know, about the flood. But anyway, uh, Revelation chapter 11. 
Also, if you look at how these two witnesses get rid of their enemies that try to kill them, fire proceeded out of their mouth. Well, there's a story like that of Elijah, where they come and try to arrest Elijah with 50 soldiers. What does he do? Calls down the fire of God. The fire devours his enemies. Okay, so that right there is another similarity between the two witnesses and the ministry of Elijah. It says in verse 7, When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. It's interesting that God brings up the beast at this point. He hadn't even been introduced yet. The beast is going to be covered in chapter 13. And so we'll learn more about that. That's referring to the Antichrist. We'll see that when we get to chapter 13. So it says that they're going to be killed after the three and a half years, after the 1260 days. And it says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So what city are we referring to here when it says it's the city where our Lord was crucified? Jerusalem. J Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem. And even Jesus said that it's not possible, you know, for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. He said, I've got to go to Jerusalem to perish there. I'm paraphrasing. But he died in Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us that the great city where our Lord was crucified is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Go to Galatians 4. Galatians, you say, wait a minute, Pastor, I thought that was the Holy Land. What do you mean Sodom and Egypt? I thought Jerusalem is a, is a wonderful, spiritual, holy place. Well, he calls it the great city. He calls it the holy city in verse number two because it is a city that is set apart. It is a chosen city. It is a city that is significant to God's plan. But unfortunately today, the city of Jerusalem is in spiritual darkness. It is a spiritual Sodom and it is a spiritual Egypt. Now, this is not the first time that the Lord compared the children of Israel unto Sodom. Because many times when he's rebuking them in the Old Testament, he compares them to Sodom because they went into sins and, and went into iniquities that were similar to the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, you know, even in the United States today, I, I bet God spiritually refers to the U.S. as Sodom. You know what I mean? Because there's so much homosexuality or sodomy in our land. But it's interesting what God says in, in Galatians 4. It says, verse 24 which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. Now, what's another word for covenant? Testament, right? Yeah. The old covenant's called the Old Testament. The new covenant's often called the New Testament. It says there are two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage, with her children. So according to this here, Jerusalem, which now is, the current city of Jerusalem, is in bondage with her children. Now you say, why are they in bondage? Because of the fact that the Bible teaches that anyone who is not saved is in bondage. You know, Hebrews chapter 7, I believe, deals with that. You know, the Bible refers to the unsaved person as being in bondage. And by and large, Jerusalem today as a city rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there are very few people in, in Jerusalem, very few of the, of the descendants of Israel who live in Jerusalem that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, 99% don't. And it's a spiritual Sodom. It's a spiritual Egypt over there. He says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So what we see, and it's a great chapter, uh, I would highly recommend reading Galatians 3 and 4. If you want to know God's view on Israel, if you want to get good doctrine in the New Testament on Israel, Galatians 3 and 4. Back to Revelation 11, if you would. But what we see is that the heavenly Jerusalem is our capital city. I mean, that's the city that we identify with. But do we identify with the physical current city of Jerusalem on this earth now? No. no. That, that's a place that gendereth to bondage. That is a place that is more akin to Hagar, the Old Testament, uh, those that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and are stuck in the Old Covenant when they need to be moving into the New Covenant, the New Testament, which they need to be uh, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So in Revelation 11:8, 8, it said that they, the dead bodies of these two witnesses, when they're killed, will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies 
to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Now, what's interesting about this is that it says that their bodies will be seen for three and a half days by all these nations and tongues and kindreds and people. You know, I bet if someone were reading this a couple hundred years ago, they wondered, you know, how is that even possible? How could people all over the world be looking at these guys laying there? How could somebody in Africa or, or America or, you know, how are all the nations and kindreds and tongues looking at them? But here's the thing. Now with TV, the internet, webcam on these guys for three and a half days, people are going to be looking at these guys all over the world. They're going to be seeing it on the news and they're going to be rejoicing because basically they're going to be blaming the plagues on these guys. Oh, these guys are tormenting us. Now, doesn't that sound familiar with the story of Elijah? They blamed the plague of the drought upon Elijah. When really Elijah turned around and said, no, it's, it's your sins, it's your whoredoms, it's your witchcraft, it's Jezebel, it's her problem. So they're happy, they're, they're thrilled. I mean, they're, they're celebrating like it's Christmas or something, you know, that these guys are dead. It's like, I mean, you know, instead of getting a Christmas present, you get a Bible-believing preacher dead laying in the street present. You know, here you go, yeah, uh, you know. Enjoy, son. But then it says, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. So these guys lie there dead for three and a half days, and then God brings them back to life. And it says, Great fear fell upon them which saw them. So, you know, not everybody sees this, because, you know, after three and a half days of these dead bodies, some people have changed the channel and, you know, started watching something else by then. But it says, you know, those that saw them, it says, Great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. Meaning, you know, the city of Jerusalem, one-tenth of the buildings collapse in this earthquake. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. 7,000 people died as a result. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now here's a key verse, verse 14. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Now, what's interesting about that is that we see that we're continuing in the same chronology of the three woes. And I'm going to get to the three woes in a moment. But let's see what happens when the seventh angel sounds the trumpet. It says in verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Let me point out, first of all, the verb are become, okay? Are become is a very specific verb there. It's, it's past tense, but it means it's something that just now happened right now. Because if it would have been something that happened a while back, it could have said, you know, they have become. That could have been earlier. You know, the kings of this world have become. That could have been earlier. But when he says the kingdoms of this world are become, the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. It's saying at this moment, right now, the kingdoms of this world are, have just now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This is the beginning of the reign of Jesus Christ. And we know that it's going to be a millennial reign of Christ, according to Revelation 20, meaning that we've reached the end of the 70s week and the reign of Christ for a thousand years is beginning at this time. When the seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery of God is finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets and we are beginning the millennial reign of Christ. Now you say, whoa, whoa, whoa we're only in chapter 11. Why are we starting the millennium of Christ? You know, it's over? The, the, you know, the wrath is over? Well, here's the thing. When you read the book of Revelation, it goes in a chronological order. One through 11 go in a chronological order. And you see a very clear chronology. You know, when you get to chapter 6, you have the events that Jesus calls the tribulation in Matthew 24. And if you compare Matthew 24 with Revelation 6, it's the exact same events in the same order. You see the Antichrist. You see uh, wars. You see famines. You see pestilence. And you see the, 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 the people being killed for the cause of Christ with the fifth seal. Then you see the abomination of desolation. Then you, which Revelation 6 doesn't go into in detail. But then you have the sun and moon darkened. And, you know, Christ coming in the clouds, it all matches up perfectly, okay? So you've got the tribulation in Revelation 6. Then when you get to Revelation 7, you have the 144,000 sealed. You have the rapture, the great multitude appearing in heaven. 
Then in chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, you have God pouring out his wrath, okay? And then at the end of chapter 11, we just saw it. Seven trumpet sounds, it's done. Kingdoms of this world are become the kings of our Lord and of his Christ. Now, when we get to chapter 12, it starts with the birth of Christ. Are we a little out of order with the birth of Christ? <laughs> oh, yeah. And then he goes through and tells the whole thing all over again. We see the tribulation again. We see the 144,000 again. We see the rapture again in chapter 14. Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, gathers up. Okay, then we see God pour out his wrath again. Except this time, instead of seven trumpets of his wrath, it's the seven vials of his wrath. Now, those judgments are not identical. Of course, they're separate judgments, but they're happening during the same time of God's wrath. And I'm going to go into that in great detail when I get to chapter 16. So just, you know, listen to the chapter 16 sermon. It, it very clearly proves that the trumpets and vials happen at the same time beyond any of a, sh a shadow of a doubt. So Revelation 1 through 11 is in chronological order. Then we jump back in time with chapter 12 to the birth of Christ and we go through the whole story again. You say, well, why would he tell the story twice? Why did he tell the story of Jesus four times? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just to give other perspectives, just to show a different angle. It makes perfect sense. So once you get that figured out, it's real easy. You just cut Revelation right down the middle. 1 through 11. And then jump back in time, 12 through 22. And it, it lines up perfectly. All the events match up perfectly if you do it that way, okay? So let's keep reading here in chapter 11. Let's see what the third woe is. Let's see what the seventh trumpet is, because this has got to be a serious judgment. And the reason I say it's got to be a serious judgment, back up, if you would, to chapter 8, verse 13. Because this seventh trumpet has to be a very major judgment upon this earth because it's called the third woe. Look, if you would, at verse 13 of chapter 8. It says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Now, the reason that's so significant is because if we look at the events of the first trumpet, the first trumpet entailed fire and brimstone raining from heaven on the entire earth, burning up all the green grass, demolishing one third of the trees, okay, and people being, uh, you know, hit with this fire and brimstone and hail from heaven. Wouldn't you say that's a pretty major judgment upon the earth? Yep. I mean, don't you think a lot of buildings are going to go up in flames if all the grass is burned? <laughs> I mean, think about you drive through California and it's dry and there's all that grass. And keep in mind, it hasn't rained for a few months when the first trumpet sounds, okay? That grass is dry. And then fire and brimstone, all, all the grass is going to be burned up. All the green grass is going to be burned up because the dry stuff is going to get so hot and everything else is going to get, it's all going to burn up. The trees are going to be burned, one third of them. That's a major judgment. That's going to destroy crops. That's going to destroy food supply. Okay, the second judgment is where the third part of the seas or the salt water or the ocean is going to be turned to blood. A third part of the creatures in the sea and have life, they're going to die. Then the third trumpet is when God uh, poisons one third of the water supply with wormwood. One third of the water that's fresh in this world destroyed. One third of the salt water destroyed. Green grass burned up. Fourth part of the trees burned up. Then. The sun and moon and stars being darkened for various periods of each day where it's just uh, talking about how it's only going to shine for the, you know, the third part of it. It's not going to shine. It's going to be total darkness. So these are some bad judgments. These are some serious things. But what God is saying in Revelation 8, 13 is that the, the, the remaining three trumpets are going to be far worse. He says, the woe unto you is not for the four trumpets that have already happened. Oh, no. Woe unto you because of the three that are still coming. Trumpets five, six, and seven are known as the three woes because they are very extreme judgments. Now, if we look at the fifth trumpet, it's a pretty extreme judgment. That's where he opens up the bottomless pit and sends these locusts from hell. These locusts come up out of hell. And these locusts, they, they're not interested in eating any grass or trees or leaves or anything like that. No, no, they are there just to torment man and they will torment man for five months. And the Bible says that their sting is as the sting of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, who's ever been stung by a scorpion here? Anybody? My son was stung by a scorpion, and it was, it was bad. 
And, you know, it, it's, it's a very serious, uh, you know, it can actually cause people to be hospitalized. We've probably spotted, you know, for years we lived in Arizona and didn't see any scorpions. But then uh, once you see one in your house, then there's another one. And I mean, we saw like 20 of them, you know, not at once, obviously, that'd be weird. But, you know, I'm just saying over the course of the years, we've probably seen 20 of them. We've, and, and, you know, we, we pay our children. It's like a bounty hunter. We pay our <laughs> If they kill a scorpion, they get a reward, okay, for killing scorpions. I think, John, did you get the reward? Did you get the five bucks for killing one? Or who was it? Was that you or Isaac? It was a dollar. Oh, I, sorry I'm such a cheapskate, son. Sorry it was only a dollar. But anyway, you know, you got a dollar for, for uh, the bounty on the head of a scorpion. But anyway, you know, a scorpion. By, and, and the Bible says it's going to be so bad for five months of just being tormented by these locusts that sting like a scorpion. He said that in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. And shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. I mean, people will wish that they were dead. It's so bad. So you can see why that's the first woe. Okay, then if you look at the sixth trumpet, you can see why it's the second woe, because that's when this army of 200 million come, just destroying everything, you know, breathing fire. There's fire, smoke, brimstone, killing all kinds of people, okay? killing just mass casualties. Uh, if you look down, if you're in Revelation 9, we can just briefly look at that quickly. But it says in verse 18, by these three was the third part of men killed. Like a third of the population of the earth is killed by these armies. Would you say that's a pretty serious woe? Yep. It says they were killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone. So when you see trumpets five and six being the first and second woe, you're wondering, man, the seventh... Trumpet's going to have to be a pretty big judgment, you know, to be, to be in the same category with those two, right? Okay, look at Revelation 11. Let's see what it is. Because remember, it says in Revelation 11:14, 14, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. So the seventh angel sounds, we're going to see the third woe. Let's see what it is. He says in verse 16, the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. Now, hold on a second. A lot of people will mistake this. They'll try to compare this with Revelation 6, where he says, The great day of his wrath is come. That's not what this says. Revelation 6 says the great day of his wrath is come, meaning it's right now. That's the day of the Lord. That's Revelation 6. That happened years earlier. This doesn't say the great day of his wrath. It just says thy wrath in general is come. Which again is past tense, but meaning just now. Why? Because there's been a continuous outpouring of God's wrath up to this point. That's why is come is an appropriate verb there for God's wrath. Even though we're many years into it, it's still coming because we're on the third woe here. And the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Now, right there, we see the timing of the judgment seat of Christ. Crystal clear. At the time that the seventh trumpet sounds, that is the time when the servants of God will be rewarded. Is it not what it says? It says that now the time has come that God should give reward unto his servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. People will try to say that uh, well, oh, the judgment seat of Christ takes place at the rapture. At, at the, no, it doesn't. It takes place at the beginning of the millennium. That's what the Bible teaches, at the seventh trumpet. Then look at the next verse, because uh, where's the carnage? Where's the third woe? It's in verse 19. Look at it. It says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now, you might look at that and say, what's the big deal? That's not that big of a woe. Good night. I was expecting something that was going to dwarf the first four trumpets, something that was going to be a major carnage. But here's the thing. There is major carnage in this verse. It's easy to read over it without thinking about it. But in order to get more detail on what this carnage entails, let's go to Revelation 16 and look at the seventh vial, because the seventh vial and the seventh trumpet actually describe the exact same judgment. But the seventh vial goes into more detail. Look, if you would, at verse number 17. 
of chapter 16. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. So we have the same feeling of finality that we have with the, you know, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. It says, uh, it's done. Verse 18, there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since when were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great, and the great city was divided into three parts, talking about Jerusalem, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon man a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. What we see here is the exact thing that we saw in Revelation eleven nineteen. We saw the lightnings, thunderings, an earthquake, and hail. Those are the four things that were mentioned in Revelation eleven nineteen. 19. Here we have more detail. If we look at these details carefully, we can see why this is the third woe. First of all, let's think about the earthquake. It says here that this earthquake was such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Now let me ask this. Have we had some serious earthquakes on this earth in the past? There have been some serious earthquakes, right? What about the massive earthquake that takes place in Revelation 6? That's a pretty serious earthquake where mountains and islands are being removed out of their places. This is more serious than that. And we can get a feel for how serious this earthquake is when we read the statement halfway through verse 19 that says, and the cities of the nations fell. Now think about what that means. The cities of the nations fell. Picture the skyline of Phoenix today, right? Huge skyscrapers, right? They're going to fall down, all of them. Now think about 9-11. You remember 9-11 and you, you, know, you watch those buildings come down? I mean, it's a pretty breathtaking sight to watch a structure of that nature come down. Okay, now imagine 9-11 happening, except it's all the buildings in New York City falling. Now imagine every city in the world, buildings coming down. Because look, those buildings, yeah, oh yeah, well they're made to resist an earthquake. Not, th not this kind of earthquake. You know, they're made to resist a certain magnitude. Okay, but when this takes place. There's going to be so mighty of an earthquake that these buildings are going to be shook to the foundation and they're all going to come crashing down. And you know, God here is just showing man, you know, what you build is nothing to me. Your greatest building, your greatest achievements, they mean nothing to me. But God says in the book of Isaiah that the nations of the earth to him are less than nothing. And he said, you're not even nothing, you're less than nothing. I mean, it's, it's just meaningless to me. And God here is so angry. This is the outpouring of God's wrath. Keep that in mind. This is the seventh vial of God's wrath. And God is going to shake this earth to the foundations to where the cities of the nation are going to fall. Buildings are going to be collapsing everywhere. It's going to be shook to the foundation. Not only that, but the Bible says in verse 20, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. What does it mean islands fled away? The reason that the islands are, are fleeing away or that you can't see the islands is because the tidal wave is going to go over the tops of these islands. That's why they're not going to be found. Sorry, you know, bad news for Hawaii, you know. But, uh, I mean, tidal waves are going to come up. Now, think about earthquakes that we've seen in the past. And most notably, think about the earthquake in Japan a few years ago. Remember Fukushima? Who, who remembers hearing about that and reading about that? Well, when that earthquake hit Japan... Remember, there was a nuclear power plant, Fukushima, and what happened was a tidal wave came as a result of the earthquake and flooded the Fukushima plant there. Now, these nuclear power plants, they have all kinds of spent nuclear waste, spent fuel rods that they're storing. Some of this nuclear fuel that they're storing that's been used up, some of it takes a thousand years or more to decay. To, to get stabilized, okay? So this stuff, you can't just throw it in the trash. You can't just throw it in a landfill. I mean, this stuff is radioactive nuclear waste that can be radioactive for over a thousand years. So even if they shut down nuclear power plants, you know, you'll see them shut down a plant, that fuel doesn't go away. They still have to store that stuff. Now, the way that they store it is they store it in these uh, facilities where it's constantly being cooled. 
and they have to constantly be bringing in fresh water and chemicals and, and you know, I don't know all the details of it, but I know this, at Fukushima, because of that flood from the tidal wave, they lost power to their cooling systems. They couldn't get the power turned on. And as a result, those fuel rods began to heat up and heat up and get hotter and hotter and, and more reactive and burning. They, they began to melt through the floor. They began to melt through the wall. And then there was an explosion where these spent fuel rods were blown sky high, just spewing out all this contamination and radioactivity. And you know, in Tokyo, they're measuring all this you know, radioactive uh, matter and, and the food and water there was being contaminated with radiation. It was a major catastrophe. You know, it was, it was similar to Chernobyl would be the, you know, what a, the earlier generation would remember. Nuclear meltdown, also the reactor uh, number three at Fukushima melted down and there was just this huge catastrophe. Well look, that wasn't as serious of an earthquake as this is going to be. This is going to be worldwide. There are nuclear power plants like that all over the world. Okay, there are going to be all kinds of Fukushima's happening. There are going to be all kinds of 9-11's I mean, just this is going to be a major earthquake that's going to shake the earth, and God's wrath is poured out. He's going to grab this earth and shake it. And he's not going to shake the earth only, but he's going to shake the heavens. He said he's going to shake it, and he's going to bring down every building that man has built, every great monument that's financial or, or man's glory and man's pride and man's power. He's going to flatten it to the ground. And people are going to be weeping and wailing when this happens. And the Bible says that that's not even the worst part about the seventh trumpet. That's not even why they're blaspheming God. What they're really blaspheming God about is the hail. Because remember, there's lightning, thunderings, voices, an earthquake, and great hail. Look what the Bible says about the hail in verse 21. There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, as if the earthquake wasn't bad enough. Every stone, every hailstone, he's saying, about the weight of a talent. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. You know, we just see it in one word in Revelation 11, just there's hail. Here he gets more specific and says, look, this hail is so great that every stone weighs approximately one talent. You know how much a talent is? 50 to 60 pounds. 50 to 60 pounds. I mean, just imagine, imagine bricks falling out of the sky and you get a pay. I mean, just imagine a brick landing on you, a brick landing. I mean, a 50 to 60 pound hailstone, you say, well, I'll just go in the house. I mean, what kind of roof do you have that's going to protect you from a 50 to 60 pound hailstone? I mean, this is going to go through the roof. This is going to come through your car. This is going to come through any windshield. This is going to come, this is going to land on your head and kill you on the spot. And people are going to be blaspheming God because they're not going to know how to get away from this hail. I mean, this is horrific. This is bad. And you know what I think is funny? A lot of times people will say, you know, well, you know, the God of the Old Testament is a really wrathful God. You know, then God kind of lightened up in the New Testament. Oh, uh, really? When's, when's he going to lighten up? Because we're only like five chapters. We're, we're six chapters from the end of the book and he's not lightening up. He's dropping hailstones that, that are 50 to 60 pounds each. He's flattening every city in the world. Where, where, when's he lighten up again? You know what? God did not lighten up. He will not lighten up. God hates sin. And today, we live in a nation where sin abounds. And the pulpits of America need to be preaching God's wrath against sin. But instead, all we get is a feel-good message. And we need a feel-good message, but we also need a message of God's wrath telling us, look, God is angry with the wicked every day, and one day God's going to pour out his wrath in such a dramatic way that the cities of the nations will be collapsing, earthquakes, hail, people will be blaspheming God, and he'll say, this is what you get for being wicked and evil and defiant of my laws. Amen. And let me tell you something. Today, the atheists laugh, they mock. The Bible said in the last days there will be scorners, people who make fun of the things of God. That's the day we're living in. The sodomites, the queers, parade down the street. And all the other sins, the adultery, the drunkenness, the fornication. Look, God hates sin. And if this story doesn't show you that God hates sin, I don't know what to show you. I mean, if he's going to do this kind of damage and this kind of destruction, you know, we need to take it seriously when God says, I'm going to pour out my wrath. When God's mad, he's mad. 
And you know what? He's able to do some serious damage, as we see in this passage. It's very serious. How do we apply this as believers? You say, well, we're not going to be there for this. Well, yeah, we're not going to be there for this. You say, well, how does this apply? We ought to look at this and walk away saying, wow, God gets mad about sin. I better, I better be careful. I better clean up my own life. Now, God's not going to pour out his wrath upon his people. He's not going to pour out his wrath upon his children. But he will chasten and chastise us. And let me tell you something. The Bible does teach that God does become angry even with his own children. Have you ever been angry with your children? <laughs> you know, I mean, God got angry with Moses. You know, God gets angry. You know, you don't want to be on God's bad side. Thankfully, he's never going to do anything like this to us. But this should show you that he does hate sin. He does get mad. And therefore, we shouldn't partake of the sins of this world either. Just because we're saved doesn't make us immune from sin. You know, those of us that are saved, there, there are times when, you know, we could fall into drunkenness or fornication or, or theft or whatever the sin. You know what? God hates sin. And let this be a, a lesson to you how God feels about sin and that we ought to be serious. Plus, the other application we can take away from this as believers is just to thank God every day that we're saved Amen. and that we don't have to be on the receiving end of God's wrath. But woe, woe unto the unsaved because of the events of the seventh trumpet. So next lesson, we'll get into chapter 12 where we jump back to the birth of Christ. Fascinating chapter. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word and we thank you so much through, for salvation through faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that we'd be able to get as many people saved as we can to just help those individuals avoid this wrath that's coming. Help us to be able to pull them out of the fire and to, and to warn them before it's eternally too late. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. early this Tuesday morning, the 11th of September, 2001. Al, it is such a pretty morning, isn't it? Perfect fall morning. On September 11th, 2001, the world changed. The land of the free has now become the land of the enslaved. The people of our once glorious United States have traded their liberty for security. But has it all happened by design? December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. Many questions linger about the events of that day, that day of infamy. But one thing we know for certain, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor set in motion a course of events that would eventually lead us to a one world government. Japan began this war in treachery. We shall end it in victory. In the aftermath of World War II, the United Nations was created and the path toward a one world government accelerated. Each war brings us one step closer to what the Bible calls the end of the world. Checkpoints are being set up everywhere. The police state is tightening its grip on the people of the United States. And to those who understand biblical prophecy, what comes next will not be a surprise. At some time in the future, the King James Bible states that everyone on the planet will be required to take a mark in order to buy or sell. As our current economic system collapses and as technology expands, Cash is becoming a thing of the past. The reality of a cashless society is not far off. In fact, it's already being implemented. Despite denials by many religious leaders, 
Evil men are working around the clock to bring in a new world order. We can see the end rapidly approaching and the stage being set for the emergence of the Antichrist. We can hear the voices of those who are subverting our U.S. Constitution and promoting this global government system. A new world order. And with all this right around the corner, this film is more important than ever. Satan is working behind the scenes to set up a one world government and a one world religion in preparation for the Antichrist. He has also deceived modern evangelical Christians into believing that they will be removed from this earth before the Great Tribulation takes place. This doctrine, known as the Pre-Tribulation Rapture, teaches that Christ may return at any moment and that there will be no signs of His coming. As a result of this deception, most Christians are completely unprepared for what the Bible has warned us is coming. Although the scriptures clearly state in Matthew 24 and elsewhere that the rapture will take place after the tribulation, big name preachers, Bible colleges, and popular films such as Left Behind have taught the masses to expect that the rapture may occur at any moment. But Left Behind is a work of fiction. Christians today are not being warned about the events they will face in the Great Tribulation. To learn the truth about the rapture, we must look within the pages of the Bible itself.